we are live. Why don't we start with a quick round of introductions? Uh, just remind us, um, even if we already know you, tell us your name and what organization you're with. And, um, and maybe we'll leave it at that for now with the introductions. So in case uh, you don't know, remember I'm Nicole Young and I'm one of the core consultants and I do this work with my colleague and I'll let her introduce herself. And I'm Nicole Lezen, the other Nicole. And uh, you won't hear Stella unless she's on, unless you're on the Spanish channel, but Stella Lauerman is our uh, very valuable team member who does all of our interpretation, translation, and many other things uh, with us. How about, um, Deborah? do you wanna introduce yourself next? Sure. I'm Deborah Bone. I'm retired from the Stroke Center at Cabrillo College and I work with David Bianchi at the Family Service Agency. And I'm gonna let him be mostly our question and answer person because I talk too much and he's the guy who's, you know, the buck stops here, so. <laughs> That's a cue for you to introduce yourself, David. <laughs> uh, David Bianchi, Director of Family Service Agency. Again, fortunate to have had Deborah five years ago through the logic models and first iteration of CORE and uh, uh, delighted to have her back. So, thank you. Great. How about Colleen? Do you want to go next? Hey, I'm Colleen McLaughlin and I'm not exactly with an agency, um, which is why I'm here. Um, I have some questions about how this will apply to me. So. But I am in Santa Cruz County and have experience with nonprofits in Santa Cruz County. Great, I'm glad you're here. And how about Madeira? Hi, um, I'm Madeira. I work with Encompass Community Services. It's nice to be here. Good to see you. And Beth. Beth Love, uh, Executive Director of Eat for the Earth. Okay, um, maybe we can just ask, like, just, uh, are any of you coming with specific questions? Maybe we can start with those. And, um, and then if you're here mostly to kind of listen and see what questions co come up, then we'll make sure we make space for that as well today. But why don't we start with the uh, questions that are like known and top of mind for you? Yeah, Colleen, you wanna go first? Yeah, so um, please let me know if this is not like the forum for this question. Um, I'm more than happy to schedule a one on one. But um, so I have um, some, I have experience with uh, nonprofits in Santa Cruz County. I worked for Gemma for two and a half years. Um, and then I went to grad school. And while I was there, um, I developed a program. Um, and I've been kind of like shopping it around and have a lot of interest from um, various agencies in the community. So I figured, you know, the core RFP is out. I'm going to apply for it. Um, but I'm concerned about like kind of the entity to apply under. Um, I'm not exactly sure I want to attach to an existing agency and I think that ideally um, it would be best to apply as a pilot program but that would mean that you know I'd be starting like really from zero um and so you know while filling this out you know it wants um you know you guys want the information like you know what agency are you with and um, you know, all of these things. And so as a pilot program, I'm not sure that I would be with an agency per se. Um, and so I wanted to know if this is appropriate to apply for in that um, situation and, you know, what your, what your rules and thoughts are about that. I would say the first thing to look at in the RFP is, um, I and I, I believe it says pretty specifically that um, applicants have to be a nonprofit agency or a federally recognized tribal entity or a public education agency. And so um, pilot projects 
could definitely be the focus of, a, of an application. It would just have to be nested within an organization. And so um, I don't know if you've explored that possibility or, or started talking with any agencies, but that's um, before, you, before you spend too much more time on trying to prepare something that would probably be something to explore further. I have, I have an agency that um, I can file under. I just, um, you know, I just ideally wouldn't, but also, um, you know, there's enough interest in the program that I think that it's important to, you know, try to apply for funding as, as soon as possible. Have you thought about becoming a 501c3 yourself? Yeah, I'm working on that. Okay. And the um, the agency that's the applicant, I think again, I'm, I'll have to, I don't remember exactly which page that language is on. In terms of, like, they could basically be the fiscal sponsor and not necessarily like manage the program or, or you know. But again, so again, that would have, that would be up to you to figure out or talk with talk about with the um, agency you're considering. Um, but I'm not even sure that like agencies that are in the process of getting an, a 501c3 status would be considered eligible. Does that help, Colleen? Does that give you? Yeah, it does. Um, okay. So definitely like, you know, like, oh, what direction to go? So now I know and it's perfect. Yeah. And so I'd say you're welcome to stay on, keep listening to other questions that come up because it might still, depending on what you decide or which direction you go, might still find that helpful as well. And Madeira, did I see that you also had your hand raised that you had a specific question or set of questions? Yeah, I just have two. Um, so the first one is, if we're doing a proposal for staff training and we're talking about the demographic section of the application. Are we talking about demographics of our clients served or demographics of the staff trained? It's a good question. I'm going to look at the application to see how it's... Yeah, I'm not sure of the answer to that, Madeira. Um, if there's another round of questions because of the deadline extension, that would be an excellent one to pose to HSD. Okay. Um, because of, of the emphasis on service delivery, my inclination would be to talk about the population that's served by the trained staff because that's mm -hmm. that's the purpose of training them but totally what do you that think is the staff is the training for staff is that the like sole focus of the application or is it like a piece of no it's it's the sole focus Hmm. And is it, which tier is it in? Medium, I think. Medium. So here's what I, like, here's how I um, kind of read the RFP. Like, there isn't anything that's, at least that I can remember, that says, like, that you can't apply for things like trainings, um, like that's not specifically disallowed. There is a strong emphasis and priority on direct services. And so um, I would take that as like, that's what, I yeah, and there isn't like a really specific definition of what constitutes direct services versus not. Um, 
but it's there's, possible I'm, that something like training, like the reviewer might read it and, and wonder, okay, where's the direct service? Where's the connection to direct services? Mm -hmm. And so either like that connection, like it'll be really important to, to, to articulate that connection to the direct services in other areas of your proposal. I would still, I think it's a good suggestion that Nicole just said to like, still ask that question, still send that yeah. question to the county email address. Um, because if the proposal really is saying the service that's being, or project that's being proposed is training for staff, yeah, it's a good question about the, are the demographics then about the staff that are participating in the training or the client demographic, you know, clients who will be the ones that benefit from the staff getting trained in, in whatever you're proposing. Mm -hmm. yeah, and okay, Madeira, I think some of this will depend on how you frame the outcomes. So who are the outcomes for that section? Mm. I'm looking at the medium um, application. So the section, who are the people served under what should be done? Mm -hmm. has exactly the focus that Nicole just described. The people, this subsection focuses on the people that will participate in the direct services proposed, otherwise known as participants. So. Got it. Think about the connection to direct services. Totally. Mm -hmm. We'll do. Um, is it okay if I do my second question? This one's quick. And maybe you guys don't have the answer for it. But, um, in, if we're contracting out with like a dietitian or something like that, that wouldn't count as a collaborative proposal, right? They would just be fit into our budget. Is that correct? To me, that what you've just described sounds like a direct cost of, um, you know, a vendor consultant right. subcontract kind of thing, as opposed to a partnership between organizations or something that has, um, I mean, you're, you're basically buying the expertise of an individual there totally. as opposed to something more collaborative, right? Not, not that that person wouldn't influence what you're doing right. through, through their expertise, but it, it is different. It's different in a budget sense. It goes in a different place in a budget and in a description, I believe. Perfect. That's really helpful. Thank you. All right. How about David and Deborah? Do you have any specific questions? David, uh, looks like you're still on mute. Right, I've been responding to texts, people at the door, and meeting all at once. So I'm muting and unmuting uh, rather frequently. So. Um, yeah, again, like Deborah, I'm appreciative because we're constantly editing the text and, you know, uh, we find ourselves at times getting lost. Like, what was that question again? Because there's a little overlap and understandable between certain questions. And um, uh, for us, I think the focus question wasn't on race it, it, because the mental health programs we have don't focus on race. So we tried to go into an explanation on that. Um, we're also, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm left ultimately with the strategy and the budget questions again. I think I asked this previously, but I think my understanding was the panels can respond 10% either way and that's their limitation. Is that still an appropriate understanding of how the panel gets to react? Is it a up to 10% more or 10% less or nothing. I'm still trying to understand that because it's, for those of us that were previously funded, it's kind of a critical question. Mm -hmm. the, so I'll say there, there are still aspects of the panel process that are being flushed out. And so um, some of the, so I mean, I can tell you what, I think we've seen and then heard in the from HSD about that um, that range. 
Um, and so first of all, the, the panelists, like their primary role will be reviewing and scoring the proposals. Um, like they're not being asked to make the recommended recommendations about like fund, don't fund, that that really is gonna be primarily the staff role, like once they look at the scores. And then when it comes to making the funding recommendations, the county and city staff, yes, are gonna do their best to as much as possible fully fund proposals as they've been budgeted. But if there need to be adjustments in order to, um, you know, make the math work and be able to, you know, to fund um, if they need to, it'll more likely be, <laughs> reducing versus increasing within that 10% range. So it might be, it might end up being, you know, a 5% reduction, but like they're basically saying no more than 10% so that agencies don't find, oh, we propose this great thing, but now we can only do 50% of it. And it's actually going to be much harder to do 50% of it uh, than what we had proposed. So that's, um, that's okay, that, that helps me a little bit. So the panels are scoring again, but the staff is ultimately having to look at the entire process and funding aspect of it. Right. Okay. They might still, you know, ask the panelists or the experts to kind of help um, kind of think through the scoring, you know, as they're making those funding recommendations, but it won't be like the panelists saying like fund this one and not this one or and, and again, the agencies that are part of the larger targeted impact are also uh, able to apply separately outside of that. Yes, as long as the total amount that you're requesting through, you know, or budgeted for doesn't exceed that 25% of the total amount available. Okay. I think that it was all I was thinking about. And then I know the section on participant numbers, again, you're um, kind of like the last series of reports, you're reporting on your outcome measures, and then you're also in this application saying how many you're gonna serve with this funding. So it's again, kind of similar to last time in the sense those two things end up being reported on. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, I think in there also, um, we mentioned something, at least in our application, that obviously our client feedback surveys that our outcome and satisfaction measures come from are anonymous. So we can report on the entire group of people we're serving, but we don't have data sorting by other factors like gender or race or ethnicity or other things, because that's, we don't tie them to individual responses that are anonymous. So just, so that's, I, and I'm sure I'm not the only one in that situation where you're soliciting feedback or outcomes and satisfaction that are anonymous and therefore can't be resorted by those factors. I guess it's more of a statement than a question. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, I guess I'm wondering, is there a, specific question you're wondering no about that, I just or? I guess you know I just um, want to make sure at least and we have in our application that that's an understandable aspect of the way we solicit feedback from clients you know that we can't really do those kinds of sorts it's challenging enough I think for many of us to get most of the data and um, uh, even for us we haven't really collected age is part of the process on many of our programs. I mean, we're going to be instituting that likely for the next round. We have some idea where we are, but, you know, um, I just wanted that to be kind of out there that I'm sure we're not the only ones that get anonymous, you know, want anonymous feedback for outcomes uh, and satisfaction levels. I think you're, I think I would agree. I think there's probably um, many organizations that have or they're developing processes so they can uh, collect data anonymously and, and even if they do collect data in a way where internally they can identify whose response there that they still keep that data confidential and it's aggregated so that 
you know, it can't be tied to specific people. Um, that I would say that is a different thought process than uh, collecting data with demographics, that there are um, ways to do that and still keep it anonymous, that there are organizations that are rethinking their, their data collection and evaluations to be able to, particularly because there is such an emphasis on equity this time. And so, I, you know, I, I, I don't know if, if you have identified or if you're comfortable sharing in this session, like what the equity dimension or dimensions are that you'll be uh, saying your application that you're addressing. Um, just thinking about kind of as a reviewer reads an application, uh, hopefully they'll be looking for and they'll probably be prompted to look for kind of the, you know, the thread. Um, among all the responses, across the responses about, okay, what is the, the problem or the need or the inequities that you're addressing? Like, um, you know, what are you proposing to do to address that? How, you know, what are the outcomes you're measuring? Um, and so if there's a description of an inequity or a challenge or that it's, you know, it's experienced disproportionately by a certain population, but then there's nothing else in the application that shows that you have a way of making sure that you're reaching, you know, that particular group of people or that it, that the outcomes are, um, uh, that you're seeing the same kinds of outcomes for not just your general group of clients that you're serving, but for that particular, you know, sub subgroup or subset of people that you ad identified that where there are particular inequities, it might just cause the reader to wonder, hmm, like how, um, how will you know? <laughs> how yeah, you know I, that that's, you know? Yeah, I, and I understand. I think that um, I guess the way we try to answer that question is um, mostly through access issues. In other words, if part of the inequity is low income, then what are we doing about that to, you know, allow people? If it's about um, uh, language, you know, where are bilingual entry points and materials and um, capacity. So I think we've, we've tried to speak to those issues in, in the application so the dots can be connected. Um, and that's because, because we can't do that end step. And I don't know that we would ever have the capacity to, you know, code application, you know, code responses and with six programs go back and, you know, tie those together. I think, you know, that's the only way we have of, of answering those questions. I think, I think that was all I had. Okay, how about Beth? Do you have any specific questions? Sure. Um, first, I just want to own that I'm like an inveterate student. I'm just like, I want to study, study, study about this and that um, kind of is way to procrastinate from the writing. But um, anyway, um, that being the case, questions always come up in my mind. So one of them is, and you can tell me if there's somewhere to find this that I just haven't found, but um, I don't see much detail about the, um, the review process by the panelists in the, um, in the RFP or on the questions document. And I'm wondering specifically, will more than one person be reading each application if you know that? Or is that a question I should have asked before uh, two days ago? to the county? That would be a question for the county. Um, I think at the time, it's all, you know, really, I, I mean, we know that the process is um, being kind of refined and fleshed out like, like now. <laughs> and the county and city are starting to recruit panelists. Um, but beyond that, I think the only like information that we can, that we know that we can share is what's in the RFP. And so that would be a question to okay. ask, the, okay. ask the county. Yeah, okay, I'll do it. I have a related question, which is like how, you know, like if they're only, if, you know, our panelists gonna be matched to topic areas or something like that, or is, is it gonna be sort of random? So I'll ask those of the county. I have two for you guys as well. Um, so as I was, kind of working through some of the stuff I learned in the training, the last training, which I think was just yesterday um, about stories and data, I ended up having a question about 
kind of either which is a more powerful there's two two approaches that you taught about that seem in my mind to be kind of a little bit at odds with each other so kind of wondering how those fit together or which is a more powerful approach and let me look at the slides um it was um okay so the the one about um leading with shared values um you know housing should be affordable enough to be able to pay rent and still put food on the table um, and then you um, walked us through Framing 101 and had us try it and write something that started with what's wrong, a need statement, like a five sentence pitch. So are those used in different circumstances? Um, would, um, you know, which one is more powerful? Which one is more appropriate for, you know, a, a grant such as this, like starting with a, a strong need statement or starting with a values statement? Okay. I'll try and tackle that one, Beth. And okay. yes, they're they may seem contradictory, but they're for different, you know, different pitches for different purposes. The five sentence exercise was not to get you to drop the need statement, but just not to have it be four fifths of the sentences, to be rather one of the five. So um, this application, like many others, starts with a need statement, and it includes some questions about strengths or assets as well. And it's very common, especially in proposal writing, to have someone state the need and then the response, as this one does. But we recognize that this proposal isn't the only thing you're writing or trying to make a pitch with in your, in your efforts. So it may be that um, that you lead with a statement of values in something like the newspaper article or blog post that we shared at the end of the training. It may be that someone else is dictating, like in the proposal, what comes first and what comes next. But that, that five sentence and the affordable housing pitch was really to make the, the deficit conversation, the um, the statistics, the, the need statement, um, less of less dominant in whatever you're presenting. Okay, so then the, the leading with values, you might not lead with it in a proposal that asks for a need statement first, but still using that concept to include the value statements in it uh, makes it more powerful, obviously. Right, it it's, it's a, a nudge to all of us, as, you know, as we were saying, and as, as Deb mentioned, in our opening today, these are hard habits to break. We've all been sort of trained and conditioned this way to just um, talk a lot about the problem and less about values and solutions. And so it's just, it's just an emphasis uh, tilt. And then if you happen to have a shared value that's really strong, like in the affordable housing example, then that would be a great thing to lead with and then get into some of the, or, or to restate the need as a shared value. So there, there are several options there, depending on, again, on knowing your audience and the purpose of your communication. But the exercise of trying to identify what your shared values are and how you, what solutions you are seeking to um, either educate people about or what the call to action is, that exercise can be really helpful no matter what sequence you use or which, which order of sentences or, or paragraphs as the case may be. Okay, sounds good. Um, and then my third one was, um, uh, I can't read my own writing, so I don't know what my third <laughs> question was and I don't remember it, but if it comes up before we close, <laughs> I'll, I'll raise my hand. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions that have come up for anyone just from listening to each other or hearing each other's questions? Okay. Well, I know some of you have signed up for one-on-one -on -one TA sessions. So that's also an opportunity to get more specific or keep doing some more work and then come back to those sessions with uh, more specific questions. Um, if you haven't signed up for the one-on-one -on -one TA yet, there's still opportunities and um, we're gonna wait until after the board votes either way on January 25th to extend the application deadline. Um, 
you know, we're thinking that they probably will, but we're going to hold off to announce more one-on-one -on -one TA dates till after then. Um, but so if you haven't yet signed up and you think that you want to reserve a spot um, before the deadline, you can do that as well. Yeah, Beth, you want to go ahead? I can't hear you, Beth. Sorry. Um, I, yeah, I remembered my other question. Um, so um, let's see. It's asking me to do something. Oh, I just clicked a button and I don't know what, what I was clicking. So just to get the thing out of my way. So if you, I just sent a message to you, ignore it. Um, anyway, the other question is, um, and we talked about this some, Nicole, the other day, um, Nicole Young, that if I'm, if I'm leading with kind of a value statement or, or if I'm using a value statement or a need statement, a, and using a statistic to go with it, um, you know. This let me let me just say this: the the need statement I'm thinking about leading with is something like um, most people in our um, most people in our country, but it could be in our county. I could use most people in our county um, um, will um, suffer for the last three or more years of their life from a chronic disease and die from it. Um, from a preventable chronic disease for the, and die from it. Um, and then, you know, I could give a local stat. I hope I can dig up a local stat, but if I can't, um, would it be okay to cite, you know, CDC or something like that? Um, and then if I go on to say, if I go, if I drill down further, there's places where I won't be able to get local stats. So then is it kind of okay to bring in like a, a, a nationwide stat mm -hmm. about how many people are dying of specific diseases or things like that, or how many, what the average um, age of infirmity is before death, things like that are probably not available for local, local populations. Some of those kinds of statistics are available on data share or the county health rankings mm -hmm. site. And um, I think when you have your, your needs statement formulated like that and have a list of data points that you are interested in, uh, I don't know if you've used DataShare at all, Beth, but... I looked through it. Yeah, I found, I found not what I expected to find in some ways. Our county's doing pretty well compared to na national, national averages, but I can't find... I, I, I haven't so far been able to find kind of like the average age of infirmity. Like... I mean, for most people, it's 10 or 20 years of chronic disease before they die nationwide, but I can't say, you know, that for our county, things like that. Mm -hmm. And it's chronic disease caused by diet, and we are doing a dietary intervention, so it's kind of central to our... I think with... There are certain situations where you can extrapolate from national and state data, um, where you can say, you know... California overall and our county overall are consistent with or different from these state and national trends. Um, but I, I would just encourage you, you know, things that, that, that are not specifically as an indicator in data share, there are often um, other data sources or local reports, or it just, it rewards some, um, some digging and rabbit holes. And, um, but I, I do think that Data share as a work in progress is, is bound to have gaps in any of the core conditions and areas. And so don't, um, don't feel that you've hit a wall if you don't have the exact data point that, that fuels your statement, mm -hmm. because there are certainly other ways to present that rationale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's expected. There isn't going to be a data point for every single okay. need or, or response. Okay. It sounds like in general, uh, I mean, there's some, you know, like there's some really powerful statements I could make, but, um, you know, for instance, the World Health Organization came out with a paper that showed a, a number of years ago that um, food was the leading cause of death worldwide and had surpassed cigarettes. So it sounds like stuff like that is probably just best to leave out because it's not talking about our county or, yeah. or not. You know, um, of course, data about our county are the most relevant, 
but um, sometimes in communicating a need, we find ourselves um, trying to explain something that may not be common knowledge. So all of you are very steeped in the field that you're in, the work that you do, the population you see, the issues they present. And I, I would not assume, for example, that um, even a fairly well-informed reader would equate the damage of unhealthy eating with the damage of a tobacco addiction. So if the World Health Organization is warning us that worldwide, the cumulative effect of, you know, I'm just speculating here, of certain unhealthy diets could um, be more damaging in terms of morbidity or mortality or both, um, even than something as dangerous as inhaling a carcinogen, <laughs> um, that, that seems like it would be a relevant thing to include, but you decide how much room there is to make those kinds of kind of buttressing statements or arguments with data or not. Um, I, I, I wouldn't suggest ruling something out just because it's not county specific, because there are limits to what's available for the county specific data. And it's, it can, if it helps you make your case, then that's a good, I, I wouldn't rely exclusively on that, but, mm -hmm. um, but, and again, we, we mentioned this in the training yesterday. If you, if you have an opportunity to have an informed but not in the weeds reader of your application, and that's really hard to do in the 24 or 48 hours or two hours before it's due. Um, but that's the kind of, if, if you have an opportunity to line somebody up ahead of time to do that for you, they can spot those kinds of things really well. This didn't make sense to me or... Why, why does, why is this presented this way, et cetera, or the, the RFP used this language, but you don't seem to be using it in your, in your response. So for, for data points, for the compelling nature of your need statement, for the clarity or feasibility of what you propose to do about it and how you presented that, another pair of eyes can be really useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got one person yes. lined up and I'm looking for a second, so. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, hey, so good questions. Anything else? Well, um, then Nicole and I will maybe just hang out for a couple more minutes in case anybody also thinks of a question. But otherwise, if you feel that you got your questions answered and you're good to go, then feel free to sign off and we wish you luck. <laughs>